Praise and worship. I mean, everything else, we get going and I get those juices flowing. I just want to say hi to everybody. Hi. Hi. I just want to say hi to everybody. Hi. Hey, hey, all right, sorry. I was a drill sergeant in the Army, so I got to forget those old ways, you know. <laughs> Rebecca doesn't have to do push-ups anymore, so all that good stuff. So, once again, 1817 South Morgan Road, that's where our church is located, the sanctuary, Oklahoma City, and God has really blessed us. And once again, I just want to say thank you, Danny and Dee yes. They yes. took their Sunday church service and turned it into our church service to support what we're doing. And so it's our church service. That is kingdom-minded. That's what we want. So, praise God. All about you. All right. So I wanted to welcome some people today. So we have uh, people, members of the Ecclesia here, right? Daniel and Daniel. Stand up, Daniel. So this group, when I ran for state senate, uh, supported me, backed me. I mean, they completely supported me for that. And Unfortunately, my own party kicked me out. But uh, thank you guys. We appreciate you guys for being here and for supporting what God is doing. Praise God. Where is uh, Tina Brown? Tina Brown, stand up, Tina. So Tina goes out every day to the gates of hell abortion clinic, stands outside that abortion clinic, and ministers to people as they come up. Hallelujah! I mean, I mean, you have a number, I mean, the number of people she gets to minister to and the lives she saved just standing out there day after day. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. And if I'm forgetting anybody, I apologize. I just want to say I'm just recognizing that, you know, I'm, you know, I get in the Holy Spirit. It's hard for me to see straight. So anyway, um, who else we? Oh, Beautiful Restoration. Beautiful Restoration. Anyway, so listen guys, we're all here for one reason, and that's Jesus. And we get together, we get to join arms, we get to link the vision. When the Lord approached me and said, hey, I want unity in the body. I want the fivefold ministry back in the body. Honestly, I had no idea how that would look, and, and I see how that looks. Amen. And it's all of us standing up with him. So... How many of you went to the encounter last March? Woo! All right. Praise God. Did you like it? Yes. Okay. This coming March, we're doing it again. And we're going to have Mario, Lance, Andrew. Uh, of course, we'll be there. Marcus and Sharon Wick. We're doing it again this March. So mark your calendars because it's going to be absolutely amazing. Uh, you don't want to miss that. Also, Mario Murillo will be coming, bringing his tent here. We're going to do a six-night crusade Woo! in October. Uh, we have not locked in the dates yet, so follow us if you'd like. The Sanctuary OKC on Facebook, or our actual our ministry, which is Crown One Ministries, is the one that hosts that. So you can go to Crown One Ministries on Facebook also. But listen, guys, we have people pop in all the time, unexpected, and so we want to keep. We want you guys to be a part of that. So every time we do, we'll post it. And uh, I'm just so thankful that God has put these divine connections together, yes. so that we can fulfill what you were called to do. On this planet. We, we're not here by accident. We are here at this time, at this place for a reason. He has a specific purpose in your life, and that's why you're here. I love seeing people when they come sit here with their arms crossed and they get that mean look on their face. Like they don't want to be here. Because every time I didn't want to be somewhere and I went, I got blessed. So whoever you are, you're going to be blessed. And that's not counting the ones that are excited, that are already blessed. You're going to get double blessed. All right, very good. So... If you have children here, Children's Church is open right now. You are free to go back. Just go down through the hallways there. The ushers will lead you back to Children's Church. So if you have little ones and would like them to go back there, that is absolutely fine. Bring me back a, a drink box. All right. Now, I'll be quiet. I will remind you uh, there is a, a, a table, a product for them. Let's show them. Here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to see their, their uh, product table run out. Amen. I'd like to see that absolutely sell out because, listen, they did not have to be here today. They had another event. And, and, <laughs> and, uh, and so they were like, hey, we're going to be in the area. You know, we're like, come on, bring it. Listen, we 
love this couple. They they are they have such a heart for God. The the, the ministry that they are that they have is just absolutely amazing. Uh, we get to watch him. I stayed up all night one night watching him try to make coffee. It was the funniest thing I've ever seen. In my life. But Flashpoint, he's got a show. Flashpoint, it's very amazing. Absolutely amazing. I think he even said he's going to have me on here at some point. I mean, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't know. That. Anyway, listen, guys. You cannot go wrong. You will be blessed by following this ministry. And uh, he's all over the internet. He's at the encounter last year. He'll be at the encounter this year. Let's link arms. Let's join together. Let's take back what the enemy's trying to steal, starting with our families. And let's go out from there. All right? So I would like you all to please give your biggest, loudest, warmest welcome for our dear friends. Uh, Lance and Annabelle Walnut. This one's for you. Come here. Yes? Yeah. Well, let's see what you do next. Uh, God's Chaos Code. This book is on fire. Oh, this book is really going to tell you what's up. Come on. You may come. Is this for you? Oh, boy. Are you cleaning me up? Okay. Anyway, this book will really tell you prophetically what's happening in the next four to six months. This isn't all about just the... Uh, you know, the election, this is really a lot of in prophetic insight about our world that we're living in and our globe that we're a part of and the whole interesting menage of it. Okay, so um, who would like this? You may have it. Come here. That woman in the back right there. Level 10 secrets. You know, the, the thing about being in love with Jesus is he tells you secrets. And he actually is whispering to us all the time if we could stop talking loud enough to hear him. And level 10 secrets gets you, gets you to think more about living a level 10 life. Do you know, if you did a graph of your, of your ability and your, also your trajectory of what you're accomplishing, this is for you, young man. Come here. That's for you, yeah. That's for you. Yeah. 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 Really, your gift mix, your skills, and what you've accomplished. 
And then you shade it in the part that you didn't accomplish yet. You know, that's all your potential. And so what Lance does is he pulls out, he pulls out all the stops and gives you a lot of clues about igniting your thought processes towards those areas that you're not going towards. That's why I love listening to him. I already listened to him for over 35 years. <laughs> I still, I still listen to him all the time. You know what I mean? At one time, I really heard his feelings. Like, Lance, I, I, that was his only media department for the first 30 years. So I was like, Lance, you know, I am listening to other speakers now. I, I became Johnny One Note, I'm afraid. And I realized that by listening to you only for all this time, I actually don't know much about anything else. He goes, what? I said, well, don't worry, I still listen to you. And I just diversified a little. But anyway, these other ones, these are really um, pretty thick products. Like there's a lot, there's a lot of meat on them bare bones. So anybody who does a lot of studying, who's the most who spends the most time in studying outside of the Bible? Who has tons of time? Come here. Because this is gonna take some time. Come on up. There's a lot to really What is it? What does it say? What's the title of it? Listen to me, she nation rising. This is about the Come ultimate here. end time movement of God. This is where you need to nations. I don't have language for it. I know, I'm just telling you what it is. Bouillon cube. It's yeah, like okay. a bouillon cube. Add water. It's a battle of nations right now. <laughs> I think it's a battle of nations. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's the seven mount mandate. That's just Come up here. Yeah. But this, this, is the, this is the core revelation yeah. well, that preceded the, core. the emergence of Trump. So this is yeah. where the Lord had us for 10 years. Whether we got it or not, ready or not, here came fake news and politics and everything we're up against now. That explains the battle for them. Plus it helps you realize your sphere of influence, where you need to be going towards. Now what's this front row? Everybody's making signs. Is this whole front row? This whole front row will show you guys are plenty more of that. Well, I got a little bit of time for you to bring on two more because I really want to know. Well, no, I'll tell you what about the sheet cases rise. We'll talk about it. Yeah, I actually did. Let me edit that. Let me edit that. One more. I'm supposed to just drop this off like Rudolph's nose. I don't know where it's going. Well, it's, it is, you know, we wanted to be here. It's kind of like we weren't just in the neighborhood. We were looking forward to being here. I uh, was looking forward to being here. And you know what's interesting is, in the encounter, just a little footnote on how God does things, with that encounter, I actually wasn't supposed to be there. Mario was supposed to be there, and he couldn't make it, and I answered the desperate call to be the second choice. <laughs> But it could, it seems to me, that the Lord had his hand in the thing all along anyway. Yeah. Because Andrew and I are friends. It helped us solidify for him and me uh, our feeling about Oklahoma coming out and doing these events. So we both felt good about doing another one. So in many ways, the Lord, and this was an interesting aside. Over 40 years of doing this, you start to learn things. And I'll tell you what I've been, and I've been on the deep end of the pool. I've been with some of the greatest ministries in the world, like I traveled with Kim Clement during his entire heyday of his ministry. I was like the Gordon Lindsay who would explain the crazy things he was prophesying during the evening. I did the daytime, he got to sleep in, and I took over in the morning and afternoon. Because I, I would be the teacher explaining the prophet. But when you're a, like with a William Branham or when you're with a prophet like that, you pick up on the prophetic anointing. And I always was sowing because he taught me how to sow into the anointing. And I'd sow radically, but I learned something. You sow into the ministries that you resonate with Amen. because there's something about you that corresponds to that anointing. Yeah. And so if you're a faith teacher community, you, you resonate with that, and so you sow into it. But here's the interesting, mischievous, and beautiful thing that God does. When you sow into an anointing you resonate with, you think you're getting that anointing. But what you're getting is the anointing to activate what you've got. And that's a, that's a big difference. That's how come you're sowing, but you don't end up walking around sounding like Benny Hinn. Even though you sow into Joyce Myers, you don't look like Joyce Myers. Because what's happening is God's activating you. So it's called the channel anointing. I've got a Hebrew background. Rabbis on my, my father's side. And by the way, they're... 
Uh, that's, yeah, I think about it now. I'm, I'm a Pentecostal. I'm a, actually a tongue-talking Levite. That's what I am. So, I'm like a third century merger of Levite and Gentiles. Oh, one new man. No wonder I'm confused. Okay. So, but that channel anointing is the anointing that goes down the middle of the menorah, the Jewish menorah. The channel anointing is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. How it expresses itself is in a diversity of expressions. Each candle has its own, its own manifestation. When you sow, you sow into the Spirit, but what you get is an activation of your own unique gifting. Now, for unity to come, because one of the reasons why we're doing this this morning is because this is a unity. Glad you can come back and join us or anything, okay? <laughs> See, I trust him counting as you I'm looking at right now. So, 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 but the unity that you guys are demonstrating by coming together is a very important thing because I think there's more of a magnet here to the glory of God than you realize. More of, a, uh, of an attraction to the anointed than, than you think. And the reason I know that is because the Lord impressed upon me some thoughts for you today. I don't normally have that happen. Normally I come in with a word. I come with a word for a season and I'm praying I'm in the right place at the right time because this is what the Lord said. In this case, the Lord said, nope, this isn't the word for the season. This is the word for that house I'm building. Because what you are is the house of the Lord in this territory. And the house is, what happens is some architectural structures are really big, but they're only one dimensional because it's one church's DNA in a big building. But when you can have several bodies come together, you get the diversity of the anointings. You're sowing into one anointing, but you're reaping a diversity, and it's the candlestick anointing. It's not the individual anointing. Jesus walked among the candlesticks, not the people. You want to see Jesus walk through Oklahoma. He's not walking through you, you, and you. That's a very individualistic and flattering, and in some case, um, uh, you know, self-absorbed uh, Pentecostal revelation. The truth is he's walking in the midst of the candlesticks. The candlesticks are the churches. Amen. And when you can get a bunch of those candlesticks with more than one candle on that stick, when you can get them to come into unity with the channel anointing, which is the anointing of the Holy Spirit for the region, you've got a regional church and every house explodes in its uniqueness. So, and you'll find that like with individuals, no two are alike. So you start to celebrate the differences. And I don't care if it's a small church or big church. That, that has to get sorted out right away. I remember one time when I was up in uh, New England. Great place to be for this message because New England has had the historic great awakening. We've got George Whitfield, Wesley, Charles Finney. It's in our loins. It's in our soil. Very rocky soil up there. We haven't had a big church, big move of God since the great awakenings. But it's in the soil up there. And I remember one time being in a meeting. Regional leaders, strange anointings on the thing. Kim Clement, I was bringing him in. He was coming in, and they were—he was doing. We called them regional, as a matter of fact. Now I think of it, and it drew the pastors out. All wanted to get him in their church because they had to pack the church out. And uh, I remember coming together, and there was Brother Phil Capuccio from Boston. Had a small church, about maybe like 20 feet, 25 feet or so. Now we, our church was like would go between 300 and 700, and when it would get larger, I usually would do something to make a church split and we'd go back down to help them. <laughs> there was other guys who knew how to do a thousand, thousand plus. They were like more corporate. They really knew how to grow, bro. They didn't have church split. They done with that. But uh, I remember Brother Phil. We were sitting there with these regional leaders, and Phil said, Do "You know, in the human body, the largest bone is this leg bone." It can actually carry the weight of the entire man. Two of these can are large. They carry hundreds of pounds. They literally are the mega churches, are these big leg bones, thigh bones. They're, they're the largest ones. He said, now, now some of us are small. You know the smallest bone in the human body is in the inner ear. The smallest bone enables you to hear accurately what the Spirit says, and the biggest ones have the biggest impact to run the race. So if you've got an army down here and you can't hear accurately what the Spirit says, you're running in the wrong direction. But if you're here in the right direction, you don't have enough force behind it. Well, I do remember a great teacher I studied once said, if you come up with an army of 1,000 against someone with 10,000, you're better off determining terms of peace than going to war. That's what Jesus said. He said, calculate what you've got when you're up against an enemy. 
So regionally speaking, if you want to see the move of God for America, well, you all pray for the White House. I appreciate that. We pray for government and rulers and that stuff. We all too, and our prayers all have their necessary effect. But you have direct spiritual authority over your own backyard. Amen. You're more accountable before heaven the closer in proximity the situation gets to you. So what's going on in your city and in your state, in your backyard, in your governor's mansion, and in your school system is something you have far more authority on than what you're sitting on the edge of your you know, couch watching and you know getting upset with uh, late night with the national situation. Because if every territory took care of their territory, it would change the national situation. Come on, that's good. So what I'm saying is there's something unique happening here. And because there's a Pastor Danny and Dee and Hart and, and Pastor Stephen and Rebecca, but there's other churches here. I heard, I can see, I heard some people pointed out. I just want to point out that what you're doing is a really important thing. It's not just like, hey, every now and then we have a get together where there's a speaker. You have to be really intentional about this because God's building his house. Amen. And, and what will happen is if you build the house that God wants to build, that when you come together, you're going to have a complement of anointings and giftings. That will come together, and then you'll be able to sow into that and reap growth in your own anointing and your own gift. So in an odd way, I want to go for a moment. Macro and micro, I want to talk about you personally and what you got to do and talk about your macro, what your church has to do, and talk about the large picture, what the church is have to do. Can we do that for a minute? Yeah. All right, so let's take a look at this. Uh, Ephesians 4, we'll just go with some of these verses. And the Lord, and oh, by the way, just I, I can't help myself. Go to Haggai if you have if you don't know where it is. It's over there in the Old Testament. Hey, Haggai or Haggai, because this is the cornerstone message the Lord gave me when we went into the COVID period of the Wuhan uh, lab leak that resulted in the ballot drops, that resulted in the theft of an election, that resulted in the demise of a great nation that may result in a backlash for a prolonged peace in this country. But uh, where we are now is the church deciding whether or not it's going to do what God wants the church to do. Come on. And there's a little confusion out there because not everybody looks at these things the same. But here's what the Lord says. God put a king in office named Cyrus. Cyrus was a heathen ruler who Isaiah 45 says God put in and anointed for the sake of his people Israel. This is when I came of age in the political arena. Because before that, I had been teaching, for those of you that never saw this before, I taught that the nations are shaped by seven mountains. Put America right there. That these four, five, six, seven, these seven mountains are the mountains that shape the nation. And they are the church is the first one. And that church secures the atmosphere for the communities and for the families. But then the education system will take over your children. The government conspires to take over everything. Media can become a propaganda arm. The arts and entertainment and athletic uh, era is nothing more than a media extension of propaganda if it's not properly occupied by believers. And it's all funded by business, Wall Street, and banking. As this thing, as this goes, as the strength of this goes, you suddenly get in a sphere war over certain people that have money and agendas who want to be able to control these mountains. That makes sense? This is called the seven mountains of culture. Now at the top of these mountains, we have something called gates of influence. The gates of influence is where the gates of hell want to control. They want to control the Supreme Court. They want to control the Oval Office. They want to control your governor's mansion. They want to control your mayor's office. Because the way that dominance hierarchies are designed, both in the primate world, in the jungle, and in human nature, which has fallen, there's a struggle and a jockeying towards uh, who is at the top of the dominance hierarchy. Hopefully, the most competent person is at the top. But sometimes, it could be, as with a cartel or with uh, Al-Qaeda, it could be that the person who gets into the cockpit is the most mercenary and criminal and intent on getting there. So you have to have a certain amount of policing of the, of the dominance hierarchy, or you could be under the leadership of people that are loaded with demons, in which case the entire vertical that they influence becomes infected with, uh, with self-destructive elements. The beauty of democracy is 
we actually have a system that is designed, if running properly, we can actually keep these high places in check because we, the people, can have a choice and an impact on how these high places operate. But something mischievous has been happening. The education realm has been taken over by the left. The media and the arts realm has been taken over by the left. Woke corporate capitalism now sees that it can crush all competition by being in bed with government. And these, uh, these four or five arenas can combine together to create a combined mindset or manipulated mind control over the mind of the nation. And people start acting like zombies, believing what they see on TV. They believe Kabuki theater they see in the news, which could very well be, as it is possible, on January 6th. And a situation that's orchestrated by the intelligence services in order to make Trump and his followers look like insurrectionists. Now, if you don't got now, who who's going to who's going to talk about that? Certain media people and certain preachers become the powerful adversaries to the devil. Because the media, like Tucker Carlson or somebody like me in the pulpit, you start getting a couple. Of, you only it only takes a spark to get a fire going. <laughs> Especially if it's near a keg of dynamite. So. Uh, so there are some of us that are particularly uh, irksome to the devil right now, and that's just the way it ought to be. And we are trying to multiply all the time. There's other people in this area. Steve Bannon is in this area as well in the media. But what I'm trying to show you is this is templates to explain complex things going on in simple ways that make sense. Your head can nod when you see it, even on a napkin. So the gates of influence is the, is the top of that dominance hierarchy. And so I put that there because that's the Chinese word for gate. And since China's what we're dealing with, that's the gate. And our job is we've got to be actually moving towards the gates of hell, which means what? Well, guess what? You're supposed to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. Well, now, this faith people are the only people that have a clue what this is talking about. Because, you see, if you get too detached over here in the word and in the spirit, and I don't watch anything else, I just watch Flashpoint and whatever. See, here's the problem. If you are not going into all the world, then you can't complain when all the world comes after you. Go into all the world. We've done it. We've done it geographically. Mozambique, Kenya, India, China, Iran. Heck, there's more evangelism going on in Iran and China right now than there is in the United States. Come on. The problem is we have to stop looking at this like going to all the world is a geographic thing and then rapture. That was our theology. It now needs to be going to all the world, means penetrating all the systems. Now the university and academic system is an enemy. It has to be dealt with. Now media is an enemy. It has to be dealt with. Well, how do we deal with it? Well, that's, that's, I don't think that you have to worry about that. You just, you just have to understand that your assignment could be to go into all the systems, or you could be a partner with somebody, or you could be the intercessor that comes alongside somebody anointed to do it. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Anyway, so this is the lay of the land in terms of that. So uh, these seven mountains exist in Oklahoma. So this is the national battle. Bring it down. Like I said earlier, you're not responsible entirely for what happens in Washington, D.C., but you might want to take a look at what's happening in Oklahoma City. Amen. You might be surprised at how much authority you've got locally that you're not using. What is the education system? If I was you, I'd map it. What are the primary education systems? What are they teaching? How's, what's the curriculum? Who's getting it? I'd go from the university all the way down to the local school and if necessary, get involved with school boards. Get involved with planting. If you've got Christians going to these universities, they're going like sheep to the slaughter unless you unite them or two or three together. Or you get involved with having a campus ministry so that fragile young freshmen that come in don't get mowed down by the principalities that are waiting for them at the gates of the school. Same thing with government. you got sheriffs, you got mayors. you got city council, you've got uh, government positions. You ought to be praying for who they are. You ought to be intentional about who they are. And every two years, they have to walk around and get somebody to support them. You should let them know that you're not supporting them unless they're supporting you. And some people say, well, that sounds a little bit political, Brother Lance. Well, this, this is pure ignorance because, you see, Jesus said you're supposed to make disciples of nations, not to land a couple of believers in every continent. 
disciple the nation, not make disciples in the nation. That's good. Actual go for a nation. That's good. Islam comes along 500 years after Christianity. They've taken over half the world and got seven countries. <laughs> Communist China comes up in the 19... Uh, uh, 10, 1920, 1930, they end up with Mao's revolution, 30s and 40s. They dominate the whole world. They're trying to make it all communist. Christianity's been here. The problem is Christians are always divided. They don't know if they're supposed to be focusing on heaven and the next life and prepare for the Antichrist, or if they're supposed to actually expand a little bit. But if you are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, and you're told to occupy till he comes, not keep backing up and eating silly beans till he gets here. And, why, and then and so many Christians are, are playing with far too small a deck of cards. Because they think, well, Brother Lance, I'm not supposed to be involved in that stuff. How do you know you're not supposed to be? How do you know a religious spirit didn't talk you out of your destiny because you thought it was unholy? Your unholy movie, your unholy book, your unholy magazine, your unholy golf course, your unholy... See, the problem is, what God wants to do is he wants to sanctify your passion and appetite and interest in a subject. He doesn't want to castrate it. He wants to circumcise it. I'm telling you the logic of this. God. I am the card-carrying curator of the museum of every crazy Christian idea that ever existed. I grew up in Babylon. I literally was a corporate leader at an oil company in Babylon, Long Island. Babylon, New York is a place. We had a Fortune 500 company, and I walked the hallowed corridors of the oil company where I had a great future, like young Moses in the land of Egypt. But I got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, and I thought that the only thing that was worth doing, anything, was being a preacher for Jesus, having a revival. I read about intercessors, and I read about Azusa Street, and I read about Charles Finney and, and Neil Moody, and Spurgeon, and I read about Smith Wigglesworth and Amy Simple McPherson, and got old Robert Laird and his God's generals, and Kenneth Hagin, and then Kenneth Copeland, and I was just like so miserable because here I was stuck in corporate America in Babylon. And so what do you do? You pray for God to get you into his perfect will because you assume you're out of it. And what's the perfect will? In ministry, full time, preferably. Because if you're part time, you're only part time in the perfect will of God. <laughs> full time ministry, we used to talk about. Full time ministry, that was our goal. And so there I was, well, what do you do when you're in the corporate quarters? I walked around in prayer, walked at night. Every night I walked around praying in tongues. I'd do like that. The janitor would go in front of me, he'd be cleaning things out, and I'd be casting things out. And I'd walk through different departments. I could tell what was there. I could feel the lust over there in customer service. I could feel the manipulation of witchcraft in corporate. Well, manipulation in sales and the witchcraft and corporate intimidation. I can feel the anger in the union department. I can literally walk through a prayer walk of atmosphere, close my eyes and sense what manner of spirit was dominating that place because my spirit was picking up on it. And I was doing house cleaning, literally. I was binding what was going on and loosening. Next thing you know, people start getting saved. Amen. I'm leading people to Jesus. I'm leading people. Annabelle's got her job. She's leading her girlfriend to Jesus. I'm leading these guys to Jesus. Our wedding party is made up entirely of young men, with the exception of one or two, that I led to the Lord. And the women. I had chick tracks. Remember those chick tracks? Norval Hayes introduced me to those and backed up my chick track idea. Little cartoon books. People love cartoons. Read cartoons. Won't read a book, but read a cartoon. And the best place to put it is near a bathroom. So people got to sit there for a little while anyway. So I used to have these uh, little chick track terrorist attacks. I'd unravel in the corporate office the toilet paper and take a chick track in and ravel it up. <laughs> oh, that's our man. Two, come out with that chick track. Like, I can't believe what I found in the toilet paper. You know, you know, this was your life. Look at this. They're hanging around there. After a while, people start getting saved. They'll start looking at me. Was that you did that? Well, I don't know. Might have been. I say all that to say this, that you're... Uh, as, as they got saved and they got filled with the Spirit, we started gathering together, and I started working in a, a local church. Uh, I realized later that I this is why I got Seven Mountains, because I was the guy that left the business mountain because I didn't think it was holy. I thought being in the church mountain full-time ministry was the great goal of a person who's a revivalist or a world impact or Jesus person. But I'll tell you something. To be the head and not the tail, above and not the beneath, means you have to go to the maximum, highest level of your competence or character or influence in any vertical God gives you so that you can be a light. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Or if you don't have something you're climbing, intercessors automatically get to go there. Find somebody who is there and link up with them and intercede so that that thing can get one back. Because the intercession makes these people successful. So that seven mountains came because I was in the business Babylon world. Then I went over here to the church. And then the Lord said, now, you don't have to leave that although you were called to do it. For you, it was okay. But stop preaching people out of their secular jobs in the Bible school and full-time ministry because that's not utopia. I had a guy in the Supreme Court in one country pull me aside and say he couldn't wait to tell me he was leaving the Supreme Court to go teach a Bible study in his Methodist church. I said, let me hear this right. You are stepping down from your government Supreme Court because you have an opportunity to go into ministry teaching a Bible study for your Methodist church. He said, yes, he was very proud of himself. I said, you don't listen to a thing I say. <laughs> All right, we got that? <laughs> Haggai says this. When Cyrus comes along, who God anointed as a heathen, he came for one reason. To get the Jews to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild God's house. And the whole thing God is after is his house. Everybody say house. house. You are God's house in this region. That's why I wanted to talk yes. to you. That's why I flew out and stayed out. You're the regional house. God is desperately looking for a different church. That's why he wasn't that worried when COVID hit and a bunch of places shut down. Because when it opened up, he was going to reorganize things. He wants a house. So I'm reading in this chapter because this is what it says. The Lord came, verse 1, by the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah. Interesting combination. We got a prophet and a politician. God calls a politician and a prophet to get together. But it's not. It's Haggai to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua. So we got a pastor, a prophet, and a politician separated by God to build what he wants to build. Read it right there. It's a pastor, a politician, and a prophet. And they get together, and they're going to together complete an apostolic assignment of rebuilding the house of God in their city. So the high priest said, thus says the Lord. This people says the time hasn't come for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. God's controversy is eschatology. The church then, like the church today, is confused over what God's doing when they're going and when he's returning. And because of that, the house is in confusion because we're not quite sure if we're supposed to be going or coming. Hunkering down for the Antichrist, getting ready for the rapture, preparing ourselves for persecution, or Trump's back in by August 15th. We don't know. Thus says the Lord of hosts, this people is confused on timing and priorities. My house is suffering. You guys with me so far? The word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, now by the way, is it time for you to dwell in your own panel house while my house lies in ruins? Is it time for you to focus on your church or your job or your 401k or your economic situation when my house is broke? My building project is underbuilt. In other words, God had a controversy with his own people because they were in Babylon at this time and he was making them get out of their comfort zone to get into rebuilding the house he wanted. And he says, stop focusing on your destiny, your house, your calling, your work, and your prosperity and develop a burden for my building project. Yes. Does that make Come sense? On. Yes. Come on. So consider your ways. And so the Lord starts taking them up and saying, you know, you guys, you notice that you regard. Now watch, if America goes through an economic, which is quite possible, with these people in charge of the government, because they're fools when it comes to spending money. If there is a financial crisis, double-digit inflation, just remember this. Your secret sauce is getting involved with the building project God has, because what God reveals in Haggai is, I'm going to mess with the economy so everybody that I'm calling pays attention to my house. Yes. Yes. They're going to look into the house for an answer. And then you build my house and the silver is mine, the gold is mine. Don't worry about the finances. You give me what I want, I'll take care of what you want. Till then, we're going to have some pain. 
Because God was shaking things, everything that could be shaken, to get the people out of the old pattern and into building what he wanted. I'm only preaching the word of God. It actually is a word of faith, if you think about it. So the Lord of hosts says, the Lord of hosts, Lord of hosts, Lord, eight times in two chapters. Lord of hosts. You know what the word of hosts is? The commander of the armies of heaven. Host means the legions of heaven. These are legionary armies. That means that angelic armies are behind the building project. Heaven's angels and by battalions are behind what God is doing. So consider your ways. Go up to the mountains. Get me some wood. Rebuild the temple. Why is it that you're going through all this? Because my house lies desolate while each of is building his own house. He makes it very clear. This is just the first chapter. And what happens? Well, a remnant responds. This is not going to be on the cover of Charisma Magazine. TVN isn't going to suddenly stop broadcasting to give you an emergency announcement. This is a remnant. Hears and goes, well, I think he's right. I think we've gone through a singular event here with Cyrus, this unsaved guy, this, this cussing guy from Queens on his third marriage is suddenly becomes a little It's like Samson. He may have he may have a sordid past with Delilah, but he sure is clubbing Philistines around here. I think the Lord's doing something different. So there you go. The Lord says, Look, I am with you. I am with you. And so an awakening happens. It literally says, the awakening starts. They obeyed the voice of the Lord and uh, the Spirit of the Lord, and they showed reverence. And, and so they were, they, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel. The Lord stirred the spirit of the governor of Jew. He stirred up. That word stir is the word er, you are. It refers to the awakening. It's the Hebrew word for awakening. Awakening comes to a remnant, not to everyone. It comes to those doing God's building project. Amen. Does that make sense? Yes. Everybody wants revival, but nobody. It's not going to come because you've got to. Super intense season of prayer, fasting, worship, and a couple of great preachers fly in. Take a big offering and take off. It comes because you built the house that God can inhabit. Amen. Then the angelic hosts start to do something. All right, so I got that covered. We're going to do a whirlwind tour here because I had laid a long foundation just so I could take off. All right, so now here we are, building God's house regionally. Does that make sense? And I'll tell you, this is the key to everything you want. Every unanswered prayer, every desire of your heart is giving God what he wants. He gives you what you want. He put the desires in your heart to give you what you want. But he wants something from you first. That's why you give in order to receive. You have to make the sacrifice before the fire falls. You have to give him what he wants. He loves the fact that you're working together in unity. That's, that's, that's part of the whole plan. So uh, you got the seven mountain idea over here. And you got it locally. Of course, as it goes local, it goes national. Right now, we've got sheep and goats. Sheep and goat states, sheep and goat cities. It's kind of interesting. We're watching the whole world divide itself into two groups right now. But here's the part I want, to, I want to hammer for you. One of the goals I've heard in the, in the pastors is Ephesians 4, this equipping of the saints. This is the burden of the leadership. Well, this is very important. Because each of you has an assignment in the house. Because the house isn't a physical building. It's a house of spiritual stones. Amen. That's why it's called the Tabernacle of David. It's the last great move of God. For years we always knew that in the last days I'll pour out my spirit. God says he's going to rebuild the Tabernacle of David. And we would look at the Tabernacle of David teaching and be like, well, what was it? Place of worship and access and intimacy to the throne of God because the ark was right there. There was no intermediate priesthood. You went right before that ark, got right there in the glory. And it was prophetic. It was worship. It was word. It was presence of God. It was in a tent. But I would suggest to you the part we're missing is the tabernacle of David was a mobile structure. Meaning any place that the people go, the tabernacle is constructed. That's the, that's the distinguishing factor. We focused on the worship, the word, the presence, the glory, the altar, because we were all doing that in our churches, which we figured would be like a little hosting Tabernacle of David location. God says, well, you're all going to have a measure of the glory, but you're not going to see the fullness till you come together. Till you come together, because I need to get the lampstands together so I can walk in the midst of them. So the tabernacle is a mobile structure. It's the body of Christ coming together in the unity of the spirit. Amen. And unity means more than just getting along with each other. It means with the divine order, which comes by a process of the Lord adding, yes. not you adding. Amen. 
My animal's got this phenomenal ministry going on, and it's very organic. People call and come in. It's divine. Very, you know, I like it that way. A little messy, but someone needs this or that. Next thing you know, she makes it down, writes it down. And next thing you know, someone calls and says, I happen to have this. Does anyone need it? See, that's kind of the supernatural proof of it. Friends of mine that are business guys go, hey, you know, so-and-so has this model, and they've got this thing really, you know, scaled out. And they want, you know, how you can have a storefront here, and you can get, you know, you can get in income online. Now, I know all about how to do it if I put my natural brain on it, but I just feel like a divine caution. It's like the Lord said, what I'm doing is working, and it's growing, it's increasing with the increase of God. We don't need to supersize it with an MBA strategy right now. <laughs> There may come a time when we need to do that. Even the apostles, they got so organically exciting and overflowing that they were having strife because they weren't administrating for the food distribution. And strife was getting the church, and the preacher said, look, man, this is crazy. we got people fighting out in the lobby over food, and I'm trying to preach the word. So you find out among yourselves, seven deacons. The deacons were created, basically, in order to solve the administrative problems of growth. But they weren't put on the building team. In other words, they weren't part of the strategy. They were added to it because it organically required more organization. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's what you're doing is organic. It means the Lord adds daily. Yeah. And it's great at the place you're at right now. Because when you get a little too successful, you attract all the wrong people. Oh, yeah. Everybody wants to get near you. Wants to find out what you're doing. How do you get there? They want to get to me through you. And it's like right now, they have to know who I am or you. It's perfect. So, but the equipping of the saints, I want you to catch this. He gave some, I'm in chapter 4 of Ephesians, if you don't know where I am. Jesus goes up, and what does he do? He releases, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. Actually, some as pastors and teachers. I know that there's a five-fold ministry, but the truth of the matter is every pastor has to be able to teach. There are some that are just teachers. They're lousy pastors. But there's never a pastor I ever met that was anointed to pastor a flock that wasn't a shepherd who didn't know how to feed a flock, did he? Those two go together. <laughs> for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, and the mature to, to a mature man that measure the stature that belongs to the fullness of Jesus. That's a mouthful, folks. Let's just put our hands up and ask the Lord to help us. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, you're going to quicken everybody here. Quicken everybody here. Some of you, got, you'll get a longer lifespan if you get this message. Because you're anointed for a divine function in the body of Christ. And you'll only come alive when you find your function in the body. And to do that, you have to be adjusted. You have to be chiropractically adjusted. That's that word, katartismo. The word for equip literally means to adjust like a chiropractor. Crack, crack, into alignment with your assignment and with your with the character you need and the flow of the anointing. I thank you, Lord. You're causing the chiropractic adjustment right down. Give us a spine that will not bend. Oh, building up, building up, building up the body. Building up the body. Building up the body is building up the house. The house of God is the body of Christ. The house of God is the body of Christ. The house of God is the body of Christ. Give me my house. God wants the body. God wants the body. God wants the body. When he gets the body of Christ aligned the way he wants it, then it can go right. It can go work on that next generation. You know, Jesus went to the city. Oh, the whole city was stirred when Jesus went to the city. What did he say? Untie that colt and bring him to me. There was a colt, the fold of the nest, next to an older mare, but there was a young colt. Jesus told the disciples, you go out, there's a tavern there, untied. They were literally going to take a car out of the parking lot in front of a bar. And then if an owner comes out and says, what are you doing? Say, the master has need of him. <laughs> sure enough, they're untying the guy's vehicle there. And they go, oh, hey, hey, what are you doing? And the master has need of him. It's like a Jedi mind trick. Master has need of him. <laughs> and he will return it after he uses it. Oh, the master has need of him. <laughs> Jesus, yes, Jesus. Oh, okay, you can have it. Bring that colt, okay. They'll leave that little colt. The Bible says that colt was never yet ridden by man. That's a young generation that has never seen a move of God. This young generation has been zombified by academia, seduced by social media, completely deceived by the devil, and it's never been ridden yet by a move of God. Its family structure is broke down, broke down. The church doesn't have any credibility unless they've been dragged to church by their parents, and then they lose their faith in college. 
It's a move that has never yet been written by Jesus. That's why it's going to be exciting when the body of Christ gets into a life. Untie that book, bring it in. Never yet written by God. Then when the body of Christ in unity gets a hold of that cult and says, all right, we're making an announcement, giddy up. And that cult takes that carries literally the move of God into the city and it shakes the whole city. Everybody hears, what's going on? Jesus just arrived. Jesus is going to start shaking cities with a move of God that touches the next generation. That's why you've got to have God's house. And, and I'm telling you, God's preferred strategy is the unity of the leaders hosting the move of God. Amen. Equipping the saints. Building up the body of Christ. Until we attain to the unity, the knowledge of the Son of Man, to a mature man, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now watch this. When we do that, when we do that, this is so powerful. Then we're no longer children tossed here and there by carried about by every every wind of doctrine, trickery, and craftiness or deceitful scheme. The whole country right now is being tossed to and fro because of the manipulative schemes that are going on from Washington to news cycles to race manipulation. You have no idea the extent of the vertical dominance hierarchies, the way in which they're trying to rearrange the whole nation right now so they can take it over. But, you're, but the more insight you have on it, the more dangerous you are because you're not stuck in their game if you can see the game they're playing. But what happens? You get delivered from the deception that is on the nations. You become, you don't have to go to some Q source. You are the Q source. And then it says, speaking the truth in love, we grow up. So now we're telling the truth. We know what the game is. We know what's going on with us and the world. And we're speaking the truth. But we're not speaking out of frustration or anger or retaliation. We're speaking out of love. Why? Because we're watching the edification, the building up of the whole body. Being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper work of each individual part causing the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Longest sentence there, I think, in the Bible. Here in Philippians, Paul has a long run on sentence. But here's what he says. Every individual here has the capacity to be a joint, a band, a ligament that connects to another part of the body. And your growth increases when you make the right ligament connection. So my daughter Joy was uh, young. We found out that she had a problem because her ankles were prone to break and they were just bent. She had a tendon problem where there was loose loose ligaments. And the doctor, huh? Yeah, she could bend her thumb down to her wrist and her ankle would, but it was vulnerable, it would break. The doctor pulled in, pulls aside one day and said, look, your daughter, I can tell you, so right now, she has exactly the number of bones in her body. Right now, it's this little, like, how old is she, like 10-year-old, 8-year-old, and she's going to have a new walker down the aisle. Let's say she's 24 years old, 25 years old. She's got the same number of bones in her body. The difference is she's 8 years old now, she's going to be a grown woman then. She's like this, this is heavy now, she's going to be like that heavy then. The difference is her body keeps growing because the bones are pre-programmed by a divine design to grow to a certain length and height. He said, now, she ain't going to have any new bones. They're all going to grow, and that's going to be the frame of her as a grown-up woman. And you're going to let her go. He said, you got a problem right now as a father. Those ligaments, if we do not support them, could possibly injure the growth plates. Now, the growth plate is the code in the bone that knows how big that bone is supposed to be. It's programmed to full stature. But if the ligament is injured, it doesn't communicate between the bones. And when a bone gets cut off because it doesn't have that connection, the growth plate is not activated. Now you've got a deformity in the making. In other words, the joints and the bands and the ligaments connect together the bones so that they can grow to their full growth plate potential. So you've got a growth pattern God has for you for the fullness of stature of you as a member of the body of Christ. When you come to the fullness of the stature of your membership, it means you're going to satisfy God's call in your life because you're fully grown. You don't have a growth plate stunted or you're not deformed or underdeveloped in some area of your life. But what does that require? A band or a ligament, which means a relationship with someone else that connects you to their growth plate. As they're growing and you're growing. This is a great mystery. Have you ever noticed how much warfare there is over relationships? 
When you go on here where Paul talks about his mission in Ephesians 6, we all jump over there. Finally, brother, be strong in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may stand against the schemes of the devil. For our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. We all focus on that like a separate chapter. Do you know what precedes it? Fathers and mothers with children, husbands with wives, employers with employees. It goes through all the relationships in the body of Christ that get fragmented and therefore compromise the growth of the body. Wow. The warfare is over relationships. You don't have to worry about your warfare with the Biden administration. That's prepackaged. If Nero goes after you, so be it. Your warfare that you got to watch out for is the relationship that's a band or a joint God put in your life that completes your growth plan. Guarantee the devil will pack, attack that relationship because the moment that that person's out of your life, good riddance, thank God they're gone, you just stunted your own growth. The devil gets two victories out of every division that, that is sowed by strife. They lose what you've got and you lose what they've got. And sometimes it's what's connected to them that God wanted to get over you. It wasn't even them. It was the link to them. The supply they had access to would have meant you. You guys follow me? So that's where the spirit of Leviathan comes in. Leviathan is the multi-headed spiritual principality that works on multiple levels of cutting division, working on this person, this person, so that these people can be turned against one another in groups by complex scenarios where your undealt with flesh is stimulated your self-interest is in court, and people collide and, and, and ensnare in the areas they have not yet matured, and they divide. So you have to have unity. Now it becomes a strategy to expose the works of the devil that wants to break up relationships that God ordained for the growth of his body. Does this make sense to you? So for that reason, how many would like to know how to, how to avoid that? Well, it starts with being aware that every division in your life isn't always God moving you forward. A lot of it is the devil, the spirit of Leviathan, and the spirit of strife trying to separate Come people on. from the potential fullness of the growth plate connection. Come on. So, we're looking at this by every joint plus. Everyone say here, I am a joint. I am a connector. I am a power supply. And I grow when I'm giving. Hallelujah. See, if you're giving your gift, whatever you get, there's, i got, I got to run, run on this. Why don't you go to Romans chapter 12 real quick, and then we're going to ramp it up. Romans 12 this is a crazy verse. You maybe not have heard people teach on this. Most people don't. I, I, I just felt like today the Lord wanted to say it. Because you got you got apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. you got many parts of the body. But here's an interesting little teaching on, on how you can make sure that you grow and go and flow to the fullness of what God has for you. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercy of God, chapter 12 of Romans. Are you getting some outs, by the way? Is this making yeah. sense? I'm trying to tell you. I'm giving you a big Holy Ghost data dump here. Sort it out later. Get the message. I urge you, present your body a living sacrifice acceptable to God. And do not be conformed to the world, and be trans but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, this, that you may prove it as will of God. Basically, Paul is saying, your body can get in the way. Bring your body under and never let your five physical senses dominate your spiritual development. Yeah. Secondly, if you can get your body to behave, you can focus on your thought life. Amen. And you can start to even manage the thoughts that come in, the thoughts that you don't want, the thoughts that, that, that God has given, the thoughts that are coming from you, you'll start to discern them better and you start to build antibodies in your head that have the mind of Christ. Yeah. And you'll be able, to, be able to discern what the Father's doing. That's what you got to do. That's how you grow up in your individual part. You manage your appetites and you increase in your discerning of, of how God thinks. And thank God, how God thinks is written down so you can renew your mind and reprogram your thinking right here. This is the code. So then he goes on to say, but through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you. Now he says your individual task is bring your body under and transform and renew your own mind. You, the Holy Ghost will show you where your head needs to be reprogrammed. That's not going to be a problem. The challenge will be, how do you relate to each other during all this process of you maturing? Amen. Through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than you ought to think. Rule number one is, is don't, don't have inflated ideas because that creates some unnecessary strife. But thinks with sound judgment as God has allotted to everyone the measure of faith. 
For just as there are many members in one body, and all the members don't have the same function. Now, for our, our regional body, just like in a specific church, just like in a family, God puts people together in complementary functions that are not the same. Therefore, the first area of warfare isn't going to be your similarities. It's going to be the differences you have in each other. Similarities never divide people. It's the differences. So Annabelle said, she's like a lover and I'm a warrior. Well, I got that message because I was dealing with a room full of these billionaires and millionaires and nobody could have come up with a Seven Mountain strategy and I was their consultant. And I got mad and we were at a ranch and I was drinking what's called cowboy coffee and I got a little too caffeinated. <laughs> and I got up in exasperation and I went up to a flip chart and I said, now get it straight. And here I'm yelling at all these wealthy people. I said, some of you are pure lovers. You know what that means? You're all about mercy and forgiveness and not talking bad, not getting involved with politics and just focusing on Jesus and revival and the Holy Ghost. You're laid down lovers for Jesus, you're worshipers. You just think of revival and renewal and evangelism and a move of God will solve everything. You warriors know that's naive. <laughs> because even Jesus warned them, you know, that you're going to have to love your enemies. That means you have them. Thinking that everybody's, going to, everybody's just a lover waiting to love you if you act right. There are going to be people who still kill you. you got to have deserted. Beware of men. That's what Jesus told them. So you've got that beware of men and they will kill you down pat. You know that you've got to be a lover with a sword. Sometimes you're going to have to, well, there's a time for war. There's a time to embrace. There's a time to refrain from embrace. There's a time to wound and a time to heal. No, if you put those two together, you actually might have the mind of Christ. Because just about the time one wants to kill someone, the other says, hold on. <laughs> then you go talk to them. They're a hothead, and then you go talk to them. And then you win them over. And that person with the sword goes, well, that was the right thing to do. Darn, that was right. I remember John Kelly told me one thing. He said, he said his biggest regrets in life is the times that he was a, 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 a warrior when he should have been a father. Amen. And the times that he was a father when he should have been a general. And he compromised his organization by his personal affection for people. His biggest mistake is when he should have been a general or when he should have been a father. And he got the two mixed up a lot. So how do you know which one's which? That's the statesman. The statesman is the person who, if you think about this, this is the priestly and the prophetic and the kingly anointing. The statesman is the one who is calculating, I could go with either one. I want peace and negotiation. I'm willing to forgive and let bygones and bygones. But if this is going to, if this isn't going to work out for our company, our cause, or our people, I'll go to war. We may have to take them to court and sue them. But I'm willing to settle this thing in private and not just have a handshake if they're willing to give us back that property and then and stop messing with our people. In other words, the lover wants no conflict. The warrior wants the battle. The king or the statesman determines which strategy is anointed. This one has the wisdom to use means to the end. This one has the boldness to do what must be done. This one has the purity to keep themselves from other considerations. To be like Jesus, you need to have the purity of the lover, the boldness of the warrior, and the wisdom of a ruler. Make sense? So pastors, when they come together, some of them are going to be prone towards lover, warrior, or statesman. All of you got to go to statesmen because your churches are made up of lovers and warriors. Frequently, the statesmen are the ones who can write the checks anyway. That's why God gave them the ability to be judicious about the adaptation of means to ends. You'll find your business people are typically statesmen. They might have a proclivity towards taking an hour with a fight, but they're usually married to somebody who's telling them, don't move so fast. Because lovers of war, for some reason, God puts them together in marriage. <laughs> but you got that? One model. I'm all about models. That's why Seven Mountains to me is a great model. It explains me the complexity of how these hierarchies are all competing and how they control people. This explains to me about the tension and disunity. Where you will not unify will be around these. Things. Now, you're not going to have unity problems over where you're the same. You guys with me so far? All right, you staying with me over here? You're not going to sleep on me, right? <laughs> if you have to sit up, sit up in a peak state. You have to sit up sometimes you get slouched. It's the chair. All right, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. 
So you guys, you guys want to see how, how this further breaks down? Watch how this breaks down. So look at what he says here. Many members, not all the same function. One body, many members. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. And so he says, if gifts of prophecy, you may not agree with this, but I'm just going to give it to you the way that I believe it works. Because I do all these four-factor assessments. I do the corporate. I do Myers-Briggs. I do this. I do Enneagram. Because all these assessments are doing nothing more than filtering out the unique diversity of the way God designed things. But God did, did, did design things with so much diversity that we can categorize and observe them. Yeah. He didn't give you three eyes and two heads. So we do know that you're, you know, all that differences are in the room in terms of thumbprints. They're still made up of the same squiggly lines. Prophecy. This is the seven types of people that move in these different directions. If you're prophetic in this group, joints, bands, and ligaments, we need you. You will see things in black and white. You're the person that comes to quick moral decisions. It's either right or wrong, true or false, black or white. I don't know why there's so much ambiguity around here. People are flip-flopping all the time. It's either this or that. How many of you are like that or married someone like that? They see things pretty clearly. They're not wandering around in ambiguous land. All right? But right next to them, what do we got here? Oh, let read my notes. Got one here. So we got the, uh, we have the, uh, in prophecy, according to the, then it says here, if you're going to exercise that gift, exercise and exercise prophecy according to your faith. And that means if you do speak prophetic words, this isn't only prophecy. I'm saying the personality of a prophet. I don't always want to be around someone kind of always telling me the mind of Jesus. I need to figure it out for myself sometimes. But the person who has prophecy as a motivation is always giving you an opinion as to what's right and wrong and where things ought to be going. Even when they don't have a prophecy, they're acting like a prophet. <laughs> but they should do it in proportion to their faith. In other words, if God hasn't given authority in matters of government, don't constantly be telling me what God's doing in government. You, you have an opinion. You don't have a word from God. <laughs> so if service is serving, now this one will throw you off because serving is lost. Serving is actually, serving is a divine grace that God gives for someone to complete with excellence the assignment that has been given to others. You may not have the excellence to pull that thing off, but someone who is motivated to serve has access to a divine enablement that will perfect what God wants to do in that enterprise. You can't do it as good without the server. And so we make serving something, you know, just making coffee for someone. It, it is the completion of the anointing for the assignment God's trying to accomplish. Has many functions. I serve as a server when I step in as a consultant. I'm simply, I'm simply clarifying and completing the blueprint of somebody else. And I'm serving at that moment. I'm not even paid to do it. I'm just filling in a need. But serving is a misunderstood and beautiful gift. Then we have, uh, or he who teaches and is teaching. By the way, how many people here would say that uh, you, you don't necessarily have a specific thing that you do, and, but that you feel like you're, you function to complete the blueprint that God has given other people so that they can get things done? Let me see who that is, because that's servant anointing. You fill in as needed to complete the potential. It's like a multi, it's like, it's like some people I see, it's like, a, you know, you get those knives that have all these different blades that can pop up. What's that called? Many, some of you are switch on your knives. You could do this, you could do that, you could do this, you could do that. And sometimes you say, well, where do I fit? Well, that's the point, you're a Swiss army knife. Sometimes you're the corkscrew, sometimes you're the nail file. Servant. The teacher is the person who does the teaching. This is the person who explains what's happening. This is the person who breaks it down, who shows you what it is. The person who has insight and information and detail. They can take what is being taught and go into go into greater detail about it. And they're motivated to do that and unpack it. A little different than the exhorter. And Paul lists these things, and we want well, we don't reason past them like blah, 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 blah. This is like the this is the Holy Ghost saying, hey, in the body, which ones are you? Some of you are the black and white, you see things a certain way. Some of you are completing the blueprint all the time, filling in where the need is. Some of you actually are the information people. You're the revelators of specificity. You've got insight and detail on a subject matter. You can break it down further than other people. Some of you are exhorters, exhorters are people that are like the motivational, gifted cheerleaders in the body of Christ. No matter what hell someone's going through, you find there's a redemptive message in it. <laughs> You've got something to say that encourage them. God's doing this, God's doing that. God's showing you this. Well, aren't you happy that happened? Now look what God's doing. 
And so you put these people in the same situation. It's hilarious. This person, if you spill something in the lobby, I told them they had to move that guy, but this person here is, yeah, but look at it. Look at it. Because of that, we ended up with a new kitchen. <laughs> And then this one, he who gives in is given. And this is a misunderstood gift. One seventh of the body of Christ is called to the ministry of finance. You really want to think about this. One seventh of your assembly is called to be a conduit for increased money. There's different levels of finance. There's sufficiency, there's prosperity, and there's a ministry of finance. One seventh of the church is called to tap into the ministry of finance. But for all I know, they feel a little corrupt or out of balance when they're giving themselves over to all that obsession with money, 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 money. They feel the devil comes to people like that and says, you really need to do a mission trip to Africa or, so, or go to Bible school. I'm telling you, the devil will take you out of your anointing by a religious spirit. Amen. But the one seventh of the body is disproportionately <coughs> capable of funding the building project. If they, if they, were, if they understood that was their call, and weren't, weren't upset about it. And then finally, we have uh, he, who, uh, he, who le he who leads uh, with diligence and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So I get these last two here. This is to lead and mercy. Just cover these two. How do these work? Well, the leading gift, this is the gift of administration. There are some people that logically, by their aptitude, can see what needs to be done by who and how to organize it. The exhorter's got a great vision for a great rally. The prophet says, if we don't do this, America's going to be judged. And, you know, and you've got your, your servants are all willing to do it. And what's going to happen is your leaders or your administrators, which is not always apostle, prophet, teacher, but they're in the body. They know how to administrate the thing into manifestation and get it done. Now, the mercy gift is kind of interesting. I made it small, but I really shouldn't have. Because almost... 90% of the intercessors I've met are actually mercy motivated. Yes. Because yes. mercy is the gift of God's chesed. It's the gift of God's uh, extra grace in order to stand in the gap for something lest it be judged or disciplined. Amen. It's the inclination of stepping in to where the, where the danger is and, and standing in the gap between what is needing to show up and what's happening. Amen. And the motivation of mercy is to intercept the pain so that it doesn't have to happen and to oh. take what needs to be done to bridge the gap. Hallelujah. It's a powerful gift, but that mercy can be uh, offended because if you want to see somebody that gets yeah, anyone that I've ministered to that has a wounded spirit, frequently it's a mercy person because when you've extended mercy that you've been mistreated, it creates a double wound because you're giving so much to others for you to be betrayed in a certain way creates almost a bitterness. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, I just want to share all this with you today to say this. Building up yourselves in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. How are you going to find your clarifying function? Just know there's diversity. And so you're not going to look for the cookie cutter. You're not like somebody else. But you actually are going to help build somebody else by your connection with them. But it's a, you might be a lover, a warrior, or a statesman. You could fall into any of these. You get your body and your mind under submission to God, and suddenly the anointing starts to build you up. By the way, why is it that some, we don't have healings in the body of Christ? Why is it we don't always have miracles and answer prayer? Can I tell you what the real truth is? It's because if you've got gifts of healing, and you're, you've got a healing gift with teacher, you've got a, a prophetic or a healing or a miracle gift with the gift of prophecy or the gift of giving, those, mirror, those gifts couple together in unique ways. You can have one of the gifts of the Spirit with any one of these personalities. That's right. Here's what happens. If you don't build yourself up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, into your membership ministry in the body, then you're not there for the other part of the body that Amen. needs your gift. Amen. So instead of having to ship you off to the miracle ministry of somebody and having a tent meeting we're hearing about, this is how it ends up. They come from all over to line up for the miracle. <coughs> Truth is, every body of Christ has givers. If we would find out where you are, we'd be praying and fertilizing your business ventures and praying that you get the character and discerning and not get involved with stupid investments because you've gotten anointing for millions. Come on. Disproportionate to every, every, other, every offering is valuable. That widow's might. Big reward for her, but it doesn't help us buy that property right now. Same thing with healing. We've got people that need a miracle of deliverance. By the way, deliverance, casting out demons, is a miracle ministry. Yes. 
So when there's miracles that are missing in the body of Christ, it's because somebody wasn't exhorted to grow to their full stature. Amen. And they were sitting there, you know, watching someone else preach or worse yet, trying to be like someone else. Yeah. But I'm going to pray for you all right now that you're going to find your own unique expression. Because we don't need to have people sick. The gift of healing is in the body. We don't need to have that nephew with that demon and that addiction that keeps on destroying that suicidal depression. we got the working of miracles in the body. And we've got the leadership that's dormant. Listen, somebody, Elon Musk and Steve Jobs, at one point they were in a garage. Nobody saw they were going to build a billion-dollar business, but they're in your church right now. They, got a, they have a leadership gift to build something, and they probably have a prophetic desire to do something nobody else has done yet. We have to fertilize it. Joints, bands, and ligaments. we got to connect with these people. Does that make sense? Yeah. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Building yourself up into your member ministry. Praying in the Holy Ghost. It's the one thing the Bible says, how do I get there, Lance? How do I get there? You pray in the Holy Ghost. Submit your body, renew your mind, and pray in the Holy Ghost. Amen. What will happen? You'll pray yourself into the divine appointments that are going to keep on. I found this out. Praying in tongues is like getting stuck at the D Dallas airport. If I'm ever trying to get off out of the Dallas airport, one thing about these airports is they're giant loops. I keep going around and around. There's that exit ramp, and I keep missing. I'm praying in tongues. Right there's the exit ramp. Here's this thing. I'm not rushing. And then there it is again. And after a while, I'm praying in tongues. I finally take that ramp. I can't explain how this, but your spirit knows where you're supposed That's to be. Right. Your spirit wants to calibrate you with your body assignment and your and your and your growth membership, and it's the, it, the, your spirit actually is searching the blueprint in here of which one and what you are That's to right. cause you to step up into the fullness of it. Amen. So let's stand up and pray in the Holy Ghost for a minute. And we're done. I thank you, Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord of Hosts. I thank you, Holy Ghost. I pray for this region. I pray for the pastors that have been so kind to bring me in, especially them that I know. Denny and Dee Hart, for Stephen and Rebecca Cunningham. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the other pastors that are here. You're doing something for those of you that just came in out of curiosity. Or you came in, this is what you do, or maybe you know who I am. God, say to you, I want a house. I want this region to build me a house. That when you come together from your various divisions, your various uh, battalions, that you build me an army. Because the Lord says, oh, what I'm going to do through you together is bigger than what I would do through any one of you individually. Because I'm making a statement, says the Lord. I'm causing a great and a mighty army to come together. Hold lightly the roles and titles that you're uh, accustomed to. Because the Lord says, I'm building something unique. It'll be like Solomon's porch. It'll be where they gather together to hear the teaching and to see the miracles. And the, and the gatherings are going to be unusual. They're going to increase. And there'll be various kinds of the gathering of the flock. Because I'm going to bring the cult in that's never yet been ridden. The youth that have never yet seen a move of God. And they're going to have a radical Jesus riding them in. And it's not going to be what was before. It's going to be something that's not been seen yet. The Spirit of God says you'll pray into it by the edification of the Holy Spirit. I'm building an edifice on the inside of you. Building an edifice for a greater anointing and a greater revelation. I'm building an edifice, says the Lord. I'm building a battering ram against the works of hell. I'm building something that will break down the barriers. Oh, and they said, no, oh, but we've never done this before. We've never gone there before. The Lord says, that's how you know you're crossing over into the promised land when you go where you haven't been. When you go where you haven't been, you'll get what you haven't got. When you go where you haven't been, you're going to get what you have not got. The Lord says, I'm expanding, expanding a vision on the inside of you. Oh, occupy, occupy, occupy the land. The land the previous generation has been prayed over. It's been laid hands on. It's been turned over with shovels and dedicated to the Spirit of God. Oh, and I'm going to break the curses, and I'm going to bring reverses. I'm going to cause this land to turn. Did I not say that I would send Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord, turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the children of their fathers, lest I strike the earth with a curse? Well, behold, the curse has already been broken, and I'm sending a lamb as a sacrifice for the city, and I'm causing you to rise up and apply the blood to the doorposts and the lintels of government, to uh, the education, the academic establishments, and begin to pray what you want 
instead of praying about what you don't like. Begin to call forth what you want to see and not rehearse what it is you don't want to see. The Lord says, bring to me the solution in your mouth where I'm shaping answers and authorizations. I'm shaping your prayers in a new way. I'm shaping decrees in a new way. And think it not strange, says the Lord, that the earth was shaped beneath your feet. Think it not strange, says the Lord, and that great distractions would come in the news cycles. But you remember this. There's no bigger news happening than the news of what I'm doing in your own backyard. There's no greater news that's going on than the news of what I'm doing in the midst of you. It's more breaking news here than it is there, says the Lord. And so, Father, I pray in Jesus' name for everyone here to be given the tongues that are needed to find their, that build themselves up into the edifice in the region, into the edifice in the nation. Oh, so that when Mario comes in and Andrew comes in, when I come in and various other other ministries come in, it comes into that which is already in motion by the hosts of heaven. Oh, it's already a moving phenomenon. The hosts of heaven, the hosts of heaven. Building up yourselves in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. I pray for every joint band of ligament. I pray that what is not supposed to be in your life and circumstance, you're going to have fresh discerning. There's a time when you've got to look at what's not producing. You've got to, mm, with mercy, dung about it another season. But if it does not produce fruit, then you cut it down. I'm not saying that every relationship has to be retained. And what I'm saying that I'm saying is warfare over the ones God sent. The devil will try to divide you from the ones God gives you. But you're going to have to make some prudent choices on your own too. If the people that are occupying space in your heart, your mind, your affection, with the exception of your immediate family, they're not, not, they're not optional. If something covering up the ground in your life, know this. That if it's occupying space, somebody or something else needs to be there. And the longer you are allowing what shouldn't be there to be there out of sentimentality or a lack of a desire for warfare, the more you're blocking what God wants to send from showing up. Because he can't put a new car in the driveway if the old one's parked there. So he's got to show you as you're, as you're going on. Where are the situations changing around you? Because you're going to have to upgrade and refine closer Jesus got to the end, the more particular he was about spending time with the twelve. You see him with the multitude, you see him with the seven, then you see him narrowing down, narrowing down. Because the closer he came to his legacy moment, ending, he had to focus on the critical twelve or eleven that were going to carry his anointing into the next chapter. And that's what happens when you get to a certain phase, ending a phase of ministry. You have to focus on impartation to the people and connection with the right people, and you can't be available to everybody that's got your phone number. So, Father, I thank you in Jesus' name for uh, the strengthening of the joints, bands, and ligaments of the body and for the discerning of what cumbereth up the ground that needs to be dunged about and healed or needs to be uprooted. Grant us, Lord God, that we would have the warrior where we need the warrior and the lover where we need the lover and the wisdom to know the difference. In the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone say amen. Amen. And amen. Thank you.